Welcome to the Self-Help Coaching Podcast, where insights, attitudes, and methods for success get illuminated. Learn what leaders and change workers have done and are doing now to create magnificent futures. We interview great guests who inspire you to overcome obstacles and achieve your goals. Be sure you visit our website at self-helpcoaching.com. While you're there, subscribe to us via your favorite network. Now, just relax as you listen. You can do something else, but be ready to make an important note. And let's get started. My guest today is Andrew Shatkin. And you know the old adage, uh, don't talk about religion and politics? Well, that's what we're going to be talking about. So this is going to be a lively discussion, and we'll be breaking that tab taboo. This is unprecedented for the Self-Help Coaching Podcast. Usually we focus purely on personal development. Certainly this will be about personal development, but it'll be more on the spiritual and religious and possibly political side. So the title of this interview is Life Solely About Money and Materialism or Is There Something More? And we're going to be talking about not being overly concerned about money, but love and help for all persons. My guest is Andrew Shacken, like I said. And he came to this based on his Christian faith. He will discuss his work based on Christianity. And I don't mind sharing with you, Ed, Andrew, as well as the audience, that I consider myself a Christian, though I'll bet that most Christians would say, Tony, you're not a Christian. <laughs> because, well, you know, but that's not for them to say. Absolutely. That's for Jesus to say. He makes that decision about you and me, not other people. Well, okay, very good. Because my, my beliefs are very eclectic. Uh, that's okay and, and uh but i tell you uh you know well you know i'll i'll, I'll get into you know once I, I i read the audience uh your biography uh, i'll uh i'll uh, uh when it resonates with my relation because i have a lot of relation uh I'll, I'll mention a few things and keep this in lively organic discussion andrew andrew is a graduate of hunter college having studied greek and latin by the way andrew uh when I was in, I went to Catholic private school, Our Lady of Guadalupe in Brooklyn. And in, uh -huh. in, in my younger years, I became fascinated with Greek mythology. And I would study uh -huh. voraciously all on my own, totally unilaterally. That's great. That's wonderful. Oh, I was fascinated. You know, obviously it's the cradle of Western civilization, but the mythology especially really, really uh, uh -huh. spoke to me. And as uh -huh. for Latin, my company is Auxilium, and the theme of my company is Latin. Indeed, Auxilium is a Latin name. Okay. Proficio, our virtual coaching program product. One that thing, is, Tony, there's a, a sort of a, a white box blocking your face. And by staying in this meeting, you consent to be recorded. And, it's, I, and there's a, a box which says, got it. Should I click on that box? Yes, yes. <laughs> I thought that I, I want to okay. see you fully. Yes, yes. Just click on that box and it should disappear. Okay, it did disappear. Okay, very good. And that recording is for the sake of our audience because that's how this is done. So, um, yes, I, I love Latin. I love... I'm, good I'm for you. I'm by ancient Rome uh, and I study it all but the that's time. The, that's the Catholic Church. That was the Catholic Church in absolutely, the past. Absolutely, absolutely. Not, maybe not now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, good point. So I am fascinated by both those languages and, and the cultures that uh, that, uh -huh. that spoke it. So um, he uh, Andrew has a degree, a seminary degree, MDIV. What's MDIV, Andrew? Uh, I don't know who has a seminary degree. MDiv. MDiv. Yeah, that's my Master of Divinity. Okay, that's what it is. Yeah. Okay, very good. Yeah, I have but, it in Greek, in theology, and um, and uh, languages that I mentioned. Great. You know, when I was in, in uh, Catholic school, uh, I wanted to be a priest. Uh, you did? And, yeah, and indeed, I, I was an altar boy in the church. Uh, I was thrown off the altar boys for drinking the sacristy wine. Uh, yeah, <laughs> future alcoholic. Uh, right. Been sober a long time now. Right. And, and um, but I, I was sincere in, in, uh, in my, uh, if not aspirations but ideas to become a priest but th that that faded <laughs> as i became corrupted but uh, uh i have great respect for it though of course and uh he got it from princeton theological seminary right uh, in biblical languages greek right. latin and hebrew and, and also hebrew, right? besides that has a law degree right so i that's a great 
a great mix. He is the host right. of two radio shows, which has a wide international audience, and is the author of 10 books, religious and legal, and has four more in the process. So we're talking about a prolific guy here. Andrew, Andrew doesn't waste time. He has written over 900 blogs, literary and religious. He is writing about the, he's writing a book on the miracles in the Bible and on the book of Job or the Job. Is that the Job? Job, Job, Job. is the He has written books entitled Essays on the Christian Worldview and Essays on Faith, Culture, Politics, and Philosophy. I love it. He also wrote two law books as well as a book on the parables and on the Psalms. His books have wide intersales and have been bought by many colleges and universities and by the State Department and the U.S. Supreme Court. That's a great resume, Andrew. Welcome. Great to meet you. Well, well I want to make it clear that was bought by the Supreme Court and the, uh, and the uh, State Department were two artic journal articles I wrote on the Syracuse Law Review on Criminal Procedure and an academicus, an Albanian scientific journal I wrote on the United States educational system and sexual orientation discrimination. Wow. By the way, let me say this. I oppose and abhor any kind of discrimination. I well, really don't like it. Uh, we are in agreement there. Uh, but of course, you know, in today's, in today's crazy political situation, it seems that... Uh, even the people who claim to be against discrimination are as uh, discrimi as discriminative as anyone else. And people who have a normal sense of discrimination, or one that's reasonable and logical, those people are, are accused of being discriminators by the people I just described. We're living in right. some really topsy-turvy times. It is. Let me ask you this. Let's hit on something, a very sensitive topic. I <laughs> love it. Uh, okay. Gay marriage. Okay. Personally, as a Christian, I I uh, I don't want to say I oppose gay marriage. I don't agree with it, but they can do it. The, the society permits it. But in, when you when you're in the church, I think there's a different set of considerations. I can. I, 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 I have nothing against gay people. I can. I, I really don't. Everyone should have the freedom to do what they want. They should. Uh, but, the, but the church has its own parameters. <laughs> That's right. I mean, so. That's where I draw the line. In other words, let's put it this way, Tony. You're a Christian. I'm a Christian. You're a Catholic. Uh, I was and, raised uh, Catholic, but I wouldn't say I was Catholic any longer. Well, whatever. I don't, I don't I mean, answer to the Pope anymore. <laughs> well, all I can say is that um, uh, as you get on the homosexual issue, uh, as you say, people can do what they want, and they should be allowed to do what they want. Yes. But when you enter the precincts of the church, there are a different set of rules. Right. And that should be respected. There really are. I think what, what's going on is that, you know, people are trying to change those rules to be more reflective of, quote unquote, the times or their own desires. So there's a great conflict there from between conservative people and people that are more progressive. The only thing is I, I, I don't agree with people who will say because something is older or has a, has a, a long history, as this does on this issue. Yeah, that is therefore to be discounted. I don't think so. But I, I mean, the church, the church rules are they're two thousand years old, right? And uh, uh, take something like the Catholic priesthood. Uh, you you thought about being a Catholic priest? Yes, I did. Okay, let me say this about people have a lot of confusion about the Catholic priesthood, and one of them is that uh, only men can be priests. Uh, there's a reason for that. Yeah. And it has nothing to do with discrimination against women. The priest stands in the in the position of Christ in conducting that Eucharist. Yes. He is a he's he he reflects the person of Christ. And also, let me say this: if you had a woman conducting that sacrifice, it would be very confusing because men, men unfortunately, we're we're pretty stupid, I guess. In a lot of ways, see women in a sexual fashion. We sure do. We do. We do. I'm not sure I, women. I wonder see. why. <laughs> well, uh, I was way, being sarcastic there. Yeah. Well, it's a fact, isn't it? Of course. Men see women sexually. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. And if a woman's going to conduct that thing, she's going to be seen as a mother figure. 
right. a sexual sexual figure, and there'll be confusion. It's not that the church doesn't that has anything against women. I don't think the Catholic Church does have anything against women. But in this particular job, if you're going to call it a job, right, it's a little different. Yeah, you know, I concur. And, you know, uh, I've been slapped by more than a few nuns when I was in Catholic school. Mm -hmm. So uh, if I see a, a, a woman priest, uh, I might not be able to help to, uh, to reminisce about being slapped by, by, <laughs> by uh, my Catholic nuns. But then again, I've also been slapped by a priest, too. I was a, I was a naughty little boy. <laughs> you got slapped by a priest? Yes, I was slapped by a priest once. Uh, and, they you know, say that priests, priests are very hard. At that time, maybe priests were kind of tough. Yeah, they were, they were, and I and I when I went, you know, I'm 56. I went to Catholic school in the 70s, uh, so you know that was a, a long time ago, I reckon, relatively speaking. Uh, and of course, people, you know, times all change, obviously, and, and people and new ideas uh, happen, but uh, and people are more cognizant of uh, infractions or or things that they shouldn't do. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I got a, I got some whoopings. <laughs> Do you think the Catholic Church will change its position on women's peace? I don't think so. I, I don't know. But, you know, I, I want to get into something more direct. Why okay. do you believe as a Christian and why? Or what do you believe as a Christian? What do I believe? Okay, you have to understand Jesus and what he says about himself. Mm -hmm. And I, I, this is something that's a very basic, basic understanding of Christ and his, who, who he says he is. He claimed, look, Tony, for better or for worse, I know that a lot of people are not going to like this claim. Uh, they're going to say this guy is crazy. But he did say, he did claim to be God. Yes, he, he really did. did. He did. Well, that's and, what the Bible says. And, and that is the Christian faith. If you, wanna, if you don't want to believe that, that's fine. You don't have to. But go to another organization. Go to the Lions Club. Go to Ethical Culture. Go to some other group. But if you're going to be in the church, you got to go along with this. That's what I think. That's that's not a, a crazy statement, actually. <laughs> really? And just like he, he, he not only claimed to be God, but he claimed to perform miracles, which only God can do, unfortunately. He claimed to rise from the dead. And he claimed to ascend into heaven and, and to, to continue to function. And he claims in that position to rule the world. Now, these are, this is Christianity. That's what I think. I think it's true. I'm not saying you have to believe this, Tony. I don't say that. Okay, good. But if you're going to be in the church, this is it. These are the rules. That's re perfectly reasonable. You know, uh, as, you know, as, as, as I already established, I was, I was rooted and raised in raised in Christianity, specifically Catholicism. But then as I, as I got older, you know, my, I doubted things. I learned new things. And I would say that where, where I, where I, about 25, 30 years ago, uh, I started believing that Jesus, that Jesus may not be the actual God or the son, the literal son of it's God. Right. You don't but, have uh, to. Absolutely. Uh, but that he was so self-realized that he totally recognized the God within him and that other people could too, if they realized their true self, their, the, the nature of their soul. Right. Yeah. Uh, and they could drop the, you know, the, 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 we, we have these things called egos, which is our, our way of knowing who we are. But the problem is, is that it's all constructed. <laughs> it's all constructed. The ego <laughs> is, true. is absolutely constructed, our self-identification. Uh, but the soul is not the soul. Even though I, I often can, I, uh, in terms of talking about it, identify the soul as our, our very highest values. I'm like, what are your very highest values? When you operate thusly, you're operating from your soul. Okay, and and that's and and you can know your better your truer self better when you operate that way and don't have conflict or certain or even compromise them. So that that's what I would say. But uh, you know, um, now you know one of my and I and I my Bible is dog-eared though I, I haven't touched it in a long time. It's probably an inch okay. of, of dust on it, but it is dog-eared, filled with yellow highlights. And I've been a born again Christian more times than I'm sure of. <laughs> really? But, but I right. will I will say that. My favorite, and, and, I, and I, you know, again, I am a unconventional Christian, but my favorite All right. work uh, regarding Christianity for a long time has been not from the Bible, but the book written by Nikos Kazantzakis, 
The Last Temptation of Christ. Yeah, I heard of that book. I never read it. Did you read that book? I didn't read it, but I, I saw Scorsese's movie quite a I, number of times. I think I would like to take a look at it because uh, I think it's pretty good. Oh, I highly recommend it, Andrew. Uh, and this is not, it doesn't claim at all to be from the Bible, but merely a work of fiction uh, written by Gazinsakis, developed in his own imagination. And, and I watched this movie periodically. And I have watched it at the, at the end. I have, I have literally been on the floor crying at the end. Literally. Now, I'm really? Not being, I'm not even, that's no hyperbole. Hyperbole. That's great. Uh, and, uh, and, um, and then I watched it. Uh, I have a protege. We watched it uh, simultaneously like a year or two ago. And I didn't, and I think, and I didn't have that same reaction at the end. Uh, but it was, I was still, the movie is still great nonetheless. But I just coincidentally happened to watch it just last week. Like I said, I watch it periodically. To be to what's the name of the movie? Is the Last Temptation of Christ, uh, directed wow. by Martin Scorsese. Let me ask you this: Was was Tony Quinn and Anthony Quinn in that? No, no. This is this is made another. In, this is made in about eighty eight, maybe eight, uh, starring. Um, I forget right now, but that's not important. But it's made about eight in eighty eight, directed by Martin Scorsese. Of course, very controversial. Uh, but in that movie uh is that jesus is so suffer he so suffers by his plight you know uh that he ima that he imagines that he could uh escape it and mm -hmm. and that and that's what the really the the end of the movie is about the i gotta read and, that and the, book i gotta look at that movie i recommend buy, i have a lot of dvds i'll buy it i'll get it i totally recommend. and then he realizes that that he can't escape his his fate his destiny because he must do it and um he uh and it's so i'm so affected just now just talking about it and the the really the moral of the movie and, mm -hmm. and judas is presented not as the bad guy mm -hmm. but as jesus's best friend and instrumental in jesus mm -hmm. in, in accomplishing his fate as the savior and that uh but the the moral of the movie and it's it, what what judas says to him uh when when jesus was tricked by the devil and thinking he can escape his fate as the Messiah. Right. And he says, and he said that, you know, that uh, he didn't have to die on the cross. And, and they said, who told you this? He goes, that, that angel did. And they, they looked again at the angel. It was the devil. <laughs> but, but, the, but, the, but the moral is that without sacrifice, there can be no salvation. And That's this, true. When I think about that, I... I mean, you can hear how affected I am right now because it's that's so, that is a true statement. It's so true. It's so true. Sacrifice is very essential, and the I have to say this: the sacrifice a woman makes in having children mm. is very great. Absolutely, a great sacrifice. Absolutely, and that's it's true in so many areas: maternal, as you just pointed out, spiritual, personal development, and and other even less. Uh, significant things but you know there's you can have different definitions of sacrifice maybe one that's lesser less difficult and ones that are more difficult obviously the more difficult ones are going to have the greater rewards because you you the things you give up you don't want to give up right you, you really don't want to give up so mm -hmm. you know i'm going to say one last time and then we're going to go to a commercial when to come right back okay with Andrew. fine great and and, and and is that without sacrifice there can be no salvation and, and I, what, I think what, that's the truth. I, I it me is, too, brother. Me let too. me ask you this before, yeah. before we go into this. Do you think this is my opinion? And I know it's an unfortunate uh, uh, thing to say. Most people are motivated by themselves for self gain. Yeah. 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 Of yeah, course. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> of course. But you know, I, I that, and, but you know, I, I, uh, as a, as a personal development coach, uh, I mean, I work. I, I don't work one on one anymore, but I'm the head of a technological coaching company. But nonetheless, anyway, at any rate, is that you know, it's it, you don't have necessarily have to be altruistic, but what I find that's that's best is a balance of a, of a goal or desire from the ego with a goal or desire of the soul. Have right. that spiritual motivation, and have, you know, and that so so the goal of the 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 the, the ego is not invalid but if it's if the if the spiritual side is not there the, the the contributive side considering others then you're grossly deficient uh in your pursuit but the balance is 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 not only equal but even necessary maybe not let all me, the time 
listen, there are some people who will take them. I've heard people say this about themselves. They say they're great. <laughs> oh, the, I, I, I have ego. heard people say that about themselves. That's the ego. I, can, I have a, a model of, you know, I'm, I'm, a pr, I'm a practical psychologist, no degree in psychology. I'm an NLP mm. practitioner and a life, I was mm. a life coach. Uh, I have a model of the false ego. The false ego, again, as I said, the ego is the self-identity. Your false ego is a shadow of this false identity. So it's even more false. Uh, and what it is, is whenever it's, it's not an identity, it's who, it's who you think you are. So who is this, the, you know, if you, if you know who you think you are, what does great have to do with it? You're just who you are. Great is just an adjective you're throwing on there that you want people to think of yourself. I'm great. Aren't I great? Now, the, the most other, people are not going to be, they're not going to be down on themselves. Well, you don't want to be they're, down on yourself. No, you're not going to be down on yourself. They're going to say, most people, I think when the, when, when, the, when things are pushed to the end, they will, they will be out for, and for themselves. That's my personal opinion. Well, you know, selfishness is, an, is, is built into yeah. our DNA. <laughs> it, it is. And, and by the way, the other part of my model is if, you know, if you want people to think you're great, that's the false ego. That's not your, it's not your, it's not your ego and it's certainly not your soul. And the other side of that spectrum is when you want people to have sympathy, even if you're hurting and, and want people to help you, which is perfectly natural and absolutely not the slightest thing wrong with it. But if you want them to have sympathy as opposed to just getting help, that's also what, the, what the, the desire of the false ego, because you, if you're hurting and want help, that's perfectly, perfectly fine. But you don't need a person to be sympathetic to get that. They'll just give it to you if they're, if they're some, some idea. Let me ask you this, Tony, about sympathy. Yeah. I know many people. And I, I do, in fact, express uh, concern and sympathy for people who have a physical disability or a, whatever they're, they're going through. But in many instances, many people do not choose to express sympathy. In many instances. Well, I mean, do you want to elaborate on that? Well, I think it's true. I mean, uh, for example, I mean, I, I, I don't disagree with it, but but well, 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 what I was most, talking about was when someone want, is soliciting sympathy, not when they're expressing that, that's it. That's not good. No, that's not good. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Let's, Andrew, let's take a moment to hear from our sponsor and we'll come right back because I know we're just getting sure. off to a great, great start. So let's uh, we'll take a, a okay. moment to hear from our sponsor uh, and we'll be right back with Andrew Shack. Okay. This episode of Self-Help Coaching is brought to you by Proficio. When people learn something, they want to use it so it has real value. And the best teacher is experienced. Visit www.proficio.io. That's P-E-R-F-I-C-I-O dot I-O, where Proficio will have you taking action with what you're learning immediately. You'll be closer to your goals before you even realize it. You're listening to the Self-Help Coaching Podcast with me, your host, Tony Petroza, and we're here with Andrew Shacken. And I've got to say, Andrew, we, we're right out of the gate, man. This, this conversation has been wonderful so it's far. It's been fantastic. Really? I want to ask you this. Yes. Um, uh, do, you, do you believe, do you have, I personally don't have an issue with other things. With other mean, what? I, other religious systems. Okay, of course. I don't have an issue with them. I think they have a right to their beliefs. And I think that Jesus, the ultimate answer about being a Hindu or Islamic person or whoever they are, mm -hmm. or a gay person, if you will, my opinion, Jesus died for them. He loves them. And he wants, as it says in Timothy, he wants all to be with him in heaven. So I don't think a, other faiths are excluded by Christians. I don't think so. I don't exclude them. I respect them. I, I see that I, I want to dialogue with them. I want to talk to them and understand them. And I think that uh, a true Christian will show concern and, 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 and love for all these faiths and all the people in them. Well, I think there's two basic kinds of people in the world, uh, closed-minded people and open-minded, and they can be religious or not. You are, right. You're an open-minded religious person. Uh, okay. <laughs> there's way too yeah. many closed-minded religious persons. That said, there's way too many closed-minded non-religious persons. So, so, but I, will, I, like, I do like to uh, often question a, a Christian, and again, I am an unconventional Christian, is, you know, who, who uh, claim the, the, that you know, the Christianity is the exclusive way into, into heaven. 
is that, well, what happened? What about all the people before Jesus? Did, did they just get to lose out? <laughs> uh, that is a question I cannot answer, uh, but there, was, there is a God, and that, that God existed before Jesus and, and with him, and um, maybe he wasn't revealed at that point, but I think there, there, is a, there was a God, and that God was, made, was available to all men and women. Yeah, but he, it, he revealed that, himself more exactly in Christ. Let me put it this way. Oh, more exactly. More exactly, okay. more significantly in Christ. That's all. So very good. Uh, you know, uh, you know what you believe and what I believe ultimately don't matter to anybody else. Uh, no, they don't. It, it, these are just our own beliefs, and and, and everybody else's are their own. And, and the funny thing about you know, again, as a as a as a personal development coach, I've learned about beliefs. All beliefs are constructs. You know, what we believe has nothing to do with the truth. We just believe it. Now, it may be truthful. It may be accurate. Chances are it's not. <laughs> right, right. And I got to tell you, as a, as a coach who dealt with, you know, clients, and, and, a, and I'm a very observant person, most of what people believe is false. They just, it's just false. But they, you know, you, they're not going to change their mind because, you're again, closed-minded, open-minded. Well, don't you think that, that those beliefs come from their families? That's from well. That's from what you want to talk about gods. You know, uh, when you're born, when you're growing up, your your gods are your mother and your father up until you learn other things. Uh, but that, of course, the family is is the root of beliefs. Right, and as you as you said, let me put it this way: there is a there is a idea around that uh, if I have an opinion or you have an opinion, it makes it true. And that too, I hate to yes. say, Tony, that's, yes. I don't, that's, that's nonsense. That's more prevalent than ever, it seems. Yeah, it's very prevalent. And the idea behind it is that everybody's got, I don't say that people don't have a right to their opinion, but my opinion, I don't think it's that important. It's not. It, not it, particularly. It, and you know, I think that's a, that's a great, a great, uh, terrible morass that people have gotten into today more and more is that they seem to think that their opinion is what makes them moral or right. I mean, boy, right. talk about- They define a, their own morality. Right, talk about self-righteous and egoistic people. You know, oh, I've got the right opinion. You know, I'm right. Oh my God. So, boy, talk about someone who's so, so deluded by their ego. But that's what people say. That is our society today, that everybody's got a right to their opinion. And therefore that opinion is valid. <laughs> I think that's nonsense. Well, my opinion is not that significant. I don't think it's particularly any more valid than anybody else. Particularly, it's not. It's no, it's not. not. And I say that with complete honesty. You know, you know, we have our opinions because that's a result of the ego. But that's all it is. It is neither right nor wrong, nor truthful or false. Though it may be, you know, you might argue how truth or, or false it is, maybe using facts or or some some process to get to a conclusion. But of course, the vast majority, if not anybody, will will allow such a process because they don't want to fear being their they fear their their beliefs being proven false. So they don't they'll step out of that scrutiny. I'll keep my opinion, but let's not have any scrutiny of it, please, because. <laughs> Because I, 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 don't I don't want people gone. I don't think I'm that smart that my opinion should be the should have truth attached to it. I don't think so. The excellent point. Excellent point. The, the great misconception is that people think that their opinion is a truth, and it's absolutely not. It does, they do. <laughs> so let so okay. Now let, let me get to the next question. What what is your politics? There we go. And is it based okay. on hold on? And is it based on what the party says or something more such as no. following the message and ideas there, of Christ? Okay, I am. I would say that if I were to define my politics, I would be seen as conservative, at least on the abortion issue. I believe that, um, I believe it's, it's, it's wrong, you know. On the other hand, I see the, uh, how women feel about being forced to have a baby or something, I don't know. But I think abortion is wrong. You know what, I, you know, Andrew, you know what I call uh, abortion a beautiful atrocity <laughs> well it's killing people massively well, of course it is i mean people say oh, i'm killing a fetus you do know a fetus is just a, a pre-human right you do know that it's just <laughs> that's all it is a human that hasn't been born yet <laughs> well that's why i do oppose it i'm conservative in the sense i don't know whether it's a conservative position 
I think it's the moral correct moral. I, I, I concur. It is more, at least in, in the in the, regarding the child, it's moral. Now, of course, the 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 uh, the pro-abortion argument will be like, well, is it moral regarding the mother? Well, that's arguable, but it's definitely not arguable that it's immoral against the child. That is that is irrefutable. Uh, and the so I'm conservative. I don't know whether it's a conservative position. I think it's the right position to take. Mm -hmm. I think it's the moral position. It's the value. Let's let's get down to brass tacks here. Yeah. It, it's what we we you and me or anybody in this world, the value they attach to a human being. That's really the issue. If you don't think that kid has any value, that's fine. But face up to it. You are devaluing a human being and having an abortion. Yeah. Well, that's you're, that, you're that, telling you're telling the society they're nothing. Right. Well, you, you're right. That you're absolutely correct. That's obvious. But then what the argument is, is that they're really valuing the would-be mother. So, which of course is selfish, but then there might be selfless reasons involved, but they, you know, but probably not. But it's quite, it's quite a subject with the, all sorts of facets to it. Well, uh, for me, um, I understand the position of the mother. I understand them, where they're coming from. But, um, there, I think there are many, many couples that would like to adopt a child. Of course. You know? Of course. So I don't think uh, uh, that alternative should be made clear. I put it this way. I think the mother should be advised as to the morality of the situation. At least the church, the church has a responsibility to advise the mother that this is a possible atrocity. And it's something that you might not consider doing. I think the person should be advised. Yeah, I know. I, I mean, it can it, uh, the decision to have an abortion by a would be mother, uh, you know, it may be very processed or it could be, you know, out of hand almost. But I, I don't mean to diminish that. I don't mean to diminish what a would be mother goes through, but I'm saying they may, they may have already have the you know the ready decision or the or the mindset that if I get pregnant I'm aborting or they may be much more uh you know give it much more deliberation. But I have no doubt that it when it would be mother aborts a child, uh that the 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 consequence, the emotional consequence that they have to live with is quite something. It is really and um I uh, I oppose it. And for the reason that um, it's a human life. Right. And I'm not, I'm not prepared to endorse taking a human life. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll tell you one thing I, I can say unequivocally. Uh, and as a fact, it is, I am very, 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 very glad my mother did not abort me. <laughs> That's right. What are you going to say to someone who says abortion is good? What are you going to say to that person? that suppose that decision had been made about you. Absolutely. What is the value you place on your life? Absolutely. You could, you know, and I was being a little coy there. I mean, yeah. uh, is that any person who's considering an abortion, uh, maybe one of the things they should use in that, that consideration is considering their mother's thoughts when they were pregnant with them. <laughs> Let me ask you this. This is something, uh, something I have picked up. Will you tell me if you agree with it? Most abortions are are the are the are the, are conducted on minorities, on black women. I've heard that. Most, mostly. I've heard that. Yep. And they a Planned Parenthood goes in their ghetto neighborhoods and puts up signs. Uh, I think that's my my opinion. I think uh, many many abortions are are taken by minorities, Latinos and black women. Yeah, and I, think, I think there's me, a, a disproportionate amount uh, uh, made by minorities. Yep. And for me, I'm not about to devalue some black woman or a black kid from being born. I'm, sorry, I'm not gonna do that. I'm not, I'm not prejudiced. I think a black kid has as much value, you know, should be given as much value in our society as a wealthy white kid. I mean, so I think they should be, um, I don't, I think we should be concerned about abortions being too much conducted on minorities. And on the flip side of that coin, 
uh, is that this has shown pretty, pretty irrefutably that you know that a lot of problems that afflict blacks uh, are are coincidental. I say that tongue in cheek with the degradation of the black family, the loss of the That's father right. in the home. Uh, and so, so now, okay, so now is it, so should I abort or not abort? I think the, I think, you know, so, I mean, you can argue it either way regarding the issue I just brought up, but I think the, you know, the, uh, being less promiscuous and more pro-marriage would probably be the real solution there. That would be the solution. <laughs> it would be the solution. It, it would be. Uh, okay. I think that's right. Okay, let's take a moment to hear from our sponsor and we'll come right back with Andrew Shack and great, great conversation. I know, I know it's uh, provocative, but hey, that's, it's wonderful. Thanks for being here. Okay, Andrew, great stuff. I want to talk about one other thing next time. Is there a war on Western culture? Okay, hold, hold, that, hold that thought, Andrew. That's what we'll talk about when we come back from the break. Okay. This episode of Self-Help Coaching is brought to you by Proficio. What is the key to wealth? It's not just making money. It's not wasting it, avoiding debt and costly mistakes. To get the wealth mindset, visit www.proficio.io. That's P-E-R-F-I-C-I-O dot I-O, where you can start acting like a millionaire instead of just dreaming to be one. You're listening to the Self-Help Coaching Podcast with me, your host, Tony Petroza. We're having a lively discussion with Andrew Shatt. Andrew, excuse me, Andrew Shatkin, and it's we're talking about some very controversial subjects. But let's talk about the next point that Andrew brought up. Is there a war on Western culture? I talk to kids who go to school. I see them, and I discuss with them, and I'm aware of the fact that a lot of Western books are not being assigned. Uh, it could be Tolstoy. It, it could be uh, it could be a, lo a lot of people. Whether this is good or not, I don't think the Western culture is any superior than any other culture. I think all cultures should be heard mm -hmm. yes. in our society and the school system. But I do think that Western, the great Western books, that people should know about them. That's just my personal opinion because they are great. You know, you know, one of my part of my belief system is I'm very Zen. I seem to have a natural, really natural proclivity for it. That's uh, interesting. Yeah, it sure is. And I have a protege who's, who's even more Zen than me, but he, and I don't say this with any self-aggrandizement, is that he recognizes me as like a, something of a Zen master without being <laughs> a Zen master right. at all. You know, I just have a, this instinct for it. Uh, you know, like I'm almost like a natural Buddhist, but again, I still identify as a Christian. You like Buddhism? I, I love it very much. I love Buddhism. I love, I love, I, I have such an eclectic, belief system that's like, good for, for example i believe in reincarnation <laughs> do you really i do well uh, uh that's yes i think the the buddhists believe that oh uh, yes and i'll tell you why i came to believe it because this is very interesting and i'll try to be brief with it again i was raised christian and i mentioned how fascinated i was by greek mythology as a young boy mm -hmm. totally unilaterally mm -hmm. then um i went to rome one time, and I was just blown away by Rome. Uh, uh, and when when I uh, let me hold that the conclusion of that, but then I also was a school. I was a scuba diver, and I was down in, in central Mexico diving the caverns there, the underwater caverns. And I visited Tulum, which is the only uh, only uh, Mayan ruin that's not inland. It was awesome. And mm -hmm. at, when I visited that ruin, I fell down. I became I almost. I lost my strength, to, I became heated, lost my strength. I fell down and I saw the whole place as it was when it was active in, in its heyday. And when I came back from Rome, I also started redecorating my entire living room in ancient Rome. <laughs> Pillars, no kidding. Knights of Armour, you know, the, the, Roman, you. Knights, the Roman guys, the whole pantheon there. And, and then um, also when I was in central Mexico, I'd say, I, I was riding ATVs and I was like, this some, and, and something popped in my head later on that night. That there's something here I got to find. I don't know what it is. Later on, subsequently, it occurred to me purely out of nowhere that, you know what? I 2,500 years ago, I was a Greek. 2,000 years ago, I was a Roman. 1,500 years ago, I was a Mayan. It just came out of nowhere. I had no, I was. You, 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 you believed in reincarnation. 
I came to believe in reincarnation. And not just that, not just because of these, these anecdotes, mm. but because I know how tragic life is. Life is tragic, but it also has great joy. So I'm not saying life is just It tragic. is tragic. It is tragic. It is tragic. I mean, you, know what's I, tragic about, you know what's tragic about it? We all come to an end. Well, I don't even think that's the tragedy. That's, I think, I believe that there's an afterlife. So it's not, you know, in the bigger picture, it's not so tragic. Well, but do you have an explanation as to why we have to die? Of why? We, I, because it's part of, part of God's perfection. That's why. <laughs> but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sad situation. It's sad for those and, and, who, who, who are left behind. We don't know how it is for the ones who die. <laughs> do you think when we die that we live again? Yes, you do. Yes, I do. That's very uh, interesting. Oh yeah, I mean nobody's uh, ever come back to tell the story. Nobody. So. That's just pu obviously pure, <laughs> purely faith. Now, a thing that I I have is I don't conflate my faith with my knowledge. Most people, you, they say they think that their their faith is knowledge when it's absolutely not. That if faith is believing in something without evidence or fact. Right. Uh, so uh, that's purely a, a statement of faith. But I'll tell you another reason why. I came to believe reincarnation. I saw how tragic the world is. And again, I say, I've had two, I'm 56. I've had two sisters die much at young ages. Really? Yeah. Younger? They were in their twenties. No and, kidding. Uh, so I, you know, that so, must've been tragic. Well, it, it, it's obviously it's tragic, tragic. Uh, but you know, so I'm no stranger to, to death and, and I was a soldier. So I, I know about it. And, um, and I see how, you know, how there's so much suffering in the world, especially for the little children who suffer and die early or prematurely, but not just them, but certainly them. And I'm like, well, the universe, I believe, is intelligent and self-organizing, whether you believe in a monotheistic God or not, right. uh, that it really balances itself out. What's the balance for all these, especially all this suffering, especially these, these children? And I came to believe, came to, I came to a conclusion that the universe has to organize it. They'll give those, those kids, for example, another chance at life or people who are really making terrible decisions and causing so much uh, uh, self-inflicted uh, suffering, give them a chance to come back and learn not to do that as much. <laughs> so that, that's- Do you, do you that's have an explanation as to why we all, to some extent, it, it's true, I think, we. There is a great deal of suffering. As you pointed out, Tony, correctly, there is a great deal of suffering in the world. Right. Well, you know, you talked about, we, okay, let's, okay, so that's, uh, and, and, you know, it comes from the Eastern and, and, uh, and, and uh, we're talking about Western and Eastern now. Uh, and you talked about Western books. And I, and I love the Western books. I love the Eastern books. But I, there should not be, uh, you know, a, a, a deficiency of Western books, especially in the West. Uh, but why are books and literature important to you? Because you, you are well, because, an author. You've written because, many books. Because they are important to me because I maintain the position, and I'm not changing this, that one time I read a book by a guy named Mortimer Adler. It was called How to Read a Book. He said, in this very good book, it was written in 1943, before television, before, before that kind of thing, he said that movies and, and TV shows are drugs. He says, the only thing that we can gain knowledge is through books. I'm not changing that position. I believe books are the root. Maybe you're going to disagree what's in the book. That's okay. But they are the ultimate root of knowledge. And Mortimer Adler said that he said in this book, how to read a book, he said, he said a number of things. He said that movies and TV and images are, are drugs. You don't learn from them. He said, that, he said they're drugs. And he made another comment in this book, which would not be very popular today in our present society. He said the Bible is the foundation of all thinking. What, was, people, the, what was that book again in the author? How to Read a Book by Mortimer Adler. He was a University of Chicago professor. Intriguing. And now it's hard to argue. I, I, can, I concur, at least, that it's certainly the best source of learning. And I did this in movies, really. They, they can inspire, and that's yeah, great. We're passive in movies. Right. It, 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 it titillates, but it's, there's not enough contemplation. No. Or connection. Your mind isn't connected to these images. But a book 
and print requires greater effort. Yes. Definitely. Much greater effort. And, and you know, my, you know, it's a funny thing. My best friend, at least I, I, I still maintain that title with him. Um, and it's a funny thing is that, you know, cause I'm a very spiritual recovered mm -hmm. alcoholic. He's an atheist alcoholic, <laughs> but he's a small. How long were you an alcoholic? How long were you an alcoholic? I was an alcoholic for, uh, I guess, active for 13 years. I've been sober over 21, but my, and, uh, but he's my best friend for a long time. But even though I, I have people in my life, I would consider my truer best friends, but uh, I, I give him that status in terms of uh, like royalty. <gasps> anyway, he's the smartest guy. I know, even smarter than my brother. My brother's a genius, multimillionaire from things he's done. Just my, my best friend is, is smarter than even him, but this guy lives hand to mouth. Uh, and and he, I would say he has emotional issues, not in any abnormal way, but co that causes him to live hand to mouth, hand to mouth, and and totally devour movies. He devours books, absolutely, but not books that feed his soul, that feed his emotional well being. So he he likes movies. He likes images. Yeah, but he loves to read too. He's a voracious reader. So he 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 takes everything that's yeah. available. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. But uh, my sister uh, loves, uh, she loves cable TV. <laughs> fantastic. I, she loves cable TV. I got rid of it many years ago, but I tell you what, uh, when the smart TVs came out, like about five years ago for me, you know, I, I started watching TV again and I, I went, I went like at least over a decade without watching any TV at all. But, uh, but I, I would, I also contend that 99% of the stuff that's on TV is total crap. Well, let me ask you this, Tony. Uh, do you believe this is something a conclusion I have reached because I, I do watch TV and you're right a lot of it's nonsense, but I believe the black and white movies in the 40s and 30s were better. Uh, I would say for the most part that is true for the most part not not totally there's some really you know but for the most part that's true and indeed my favorite actor is Cary Grant. <laughs> well, I think that they were uh, first of all they were more like plays. They didn't depend on special effects. Yes. They were sort of like, I think at that time, they were kind of like sets and plays. I think so. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Of course, I, I totally agree. Let me ask about, let me ask about uh, John Milton. What are, what are John Milton and John Bunyan and E.M. Forster, your favorite and most loved? Okay, author? John Milton for me, I'm a Christian. Right. And he wrote a great epic poem called Paradise Lost, as well as Paradise Regained. And I am not changing this view. He had the perception and intellect. First of all, he wrote them when he was blind. Wow, so he I didn't know that. Yeah, he wrote these books when he was blind and he uh, had the intellect to write these things in blindness. That's the first thing. The second thing is in Paradise Lost, he honed in on what I think is the true issue, cosmic issue in the world, the fall of man, the presence, the car, how evil and wickedness came to be. It's in you Genesis know, two. Andrew, and Andrew, uh, isn't that? Didn't he write about the seven deadly sins? That yeah. I don't know, but he may have. But he, um, his, he wrote this book called Paradise Lost, and that right. poem. And the the issue that he. Oh handled, no, that was in Dante's Inferno, I think. Right, probably. Okay. okay. But he, um, he, he honed in on the. With an explanation, this is something we all have to deal with, Tony. Yeah. You know this, I know it, everybody comes to know it. There is a great deal of evil in the world, yeah. a huge amount. There have been, in the past hundred years, six or seven genocides. And I would contend, yeah. I would contend, you know, as a psychologist, that evil, you know, evil can be explained psychologically, and it is, it is an ultra selfishness. It is a feeding into our negative sides where mm -hmm. we have such disapproval of another, where we don't care what happens to them. Mm -hmm. And so we'll justify anything we do. Anything we do is justified. Anything we do is rationalized. And it's well, how do you dangerous. explain that a person like Paul Pont or Stalin or Hitler, why do you think they did what they did? I mean, obviously they were all, well, even they were all socialists. <laughs> they know, were. They were all socialists. And then people like, say, oh my God, Hitler was a socialist. Yeah. National socialist. Learn about it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, one was, uh, you know, one, but well, they're all different kinds of socialists. But uh, 
they they fed into their their selfishness. They fed into their idea their, their self. They apparently derive satisfaction from sadistic actions. They were sadistic. They were unequivocally. They were sadistic. Yep. And uh, I have to say this: that um, do you believe everybody to some extent has that potential in them? I think that absolutely, absolutely. That yeah. we all, we all have, we, I think we all have a good side and a bad side. We're all half that's good, right. half bad. And which that's side right. you feed the most is the side that's going to flourish. You mentioned about socialism. Yeah. Uh, I know a lot, of, a lot of people in the United States oppose socialism. And a lot we of have been incredible are, are embracing it more and more, unbelievably. But we have been for many years a capitalist identified country. Right. We have identified, and Christianity, unfortunately, Tony, identified with capitalism. They have got, they have, ident Christians have a correct, incorrectly identified with the business section. I think they have, you know. And what do I think of socialism? I think um, it may not be worked too well. And that's clear, it doesn't work too well. But as an idea, it's pretty good. I think it's good that wealth be equalized. I think that's good. That, that poverty be eliminated as much as possible and that wealth be equalized for all people. And I believe that that's, that's something I think is a good point in socialism. I think capitalism results in class structures. It results in people greed and the desire for money. And I'm not sure I agree with that. Well, those are excellent points, and, and, and I'd, I really be, I'd have a hard time arguing with those points <laughs> that you've made, Andrew. Uh, but, you know, and, but it's, it's, you know, just like everything in life, it's a balance, yin-yang. Uh, you know, capitalism is, is, may, is only done correctly through freedom. Now, look at the Chinese communists who have really per, seem to be perfecting how they can be communist and capitalist at the same time. <laughs> And, and here in America, you know, we have varying degrees uh, that's, uh, that's, beco that's becoming uh, more abundant in, in, our, in our, 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 our economic and political structure. Indeed, FDR, one of the greatest presidents of all time, he introduced, you know, the, the New Deal and Social Security. I thought he was an excellent president. Yeah, absolutely. He was. Absolutely. He was. He was and, and, and his opponents were, were crying, socialism, you know. But he and, was trying to make it better for more people. Yes. I was, think FDR tried to improve the system and make it better for a lot of people. Oh, totally. And he was awesome. I loved him. So uh, great stuff. Let's let's um, take a moment to hear from our sponsor and we'll come right back with Andrew Shacken. Right. This episode of Self-Help Coaching is brought to you by Perficio. Perficio learns more about you as you make progress and then uses that information to help you even more. It is quasi-AI. Visit www.perficio.io. That's P-E-R-F-I-C-I-O dot I-O, where you can be helped by something that learns more about you because that is the difference that makes the difference listening to the self-help coaching podcast with me your host tony petroza and andrew shacken have, having a fantastic organic conversation we're having a great conversation oh, tony i really really enjoying this and i think it'll be i want to ask you about capitalism sure i have problems with it okay, okay. I, I sense but, that <laughs> yeah do you believe that greed and the desire for money should be the goals of life I'm glad you brought that up because I mentioned I mentioned uh, the seven deadly sins, uh, and which is uh, you know which comes from religious work. I think it was Dante's Inferno. I'm not sure. And the the Catholic Church really embraces on this the 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 greater sex of Christianity. Say no, that's that's not that doesn't come from the Bible. That's a, a newer invention. But I, as a, as someone who's a coach or a practicing psychologist. Uh, you know, I bring the spiritual element. You know, not often, but when it's applicable. The seven deadly sins, pride, anger, greed, lust, envy, sloth, uh, and gluttony. Uh, these things should, should be consciously, deliberately reduced in a person's life. And of course, pride is the deadliest of all sins. And then, and then there are seven inverse virtues, which one can focus on uh, as the other side of them. These things are 
will vastly improve uh, one's life and the life of everyone around them when they do that. That said, uh, can I articulate that question one more time, please? Uh, I don't remember oh, about capitalism. Do you think greed and the desire for money right. should, okay. govern, our, should right. govern our system? That's capitalism. No, no it's getting not. more money, greed, getting greed. more things, materialism. That's capitalism, and you know it, Tony. That's right. what it Gre is. Greed is is a personal sin. Uh, it's not a sin that's outside the self. So uh, if a, if there's a system that that aids greed then that system should be close, should perhaps be adjusted or at least scrutinized. But greed is a personal sin. Uh, you know, and maybe a group can make a sin, uh, can make the sin of greed, but only if the, if the people are complicit. Because you, know, you can't sin for me, only I can do it. R right, Andrew? I can't. That's right. Right? If your sins are not my sins, maybe we have the same sins and work together <laughs> to, <laughs> to make a super sin. <laughs> you made a very good point about pride. The story in Ge the fall of man of Adam and Eve in, in Genesis 2, it came about through the, we, that's what it says. You don't have to believe it, but the, it is a something that is there. It was the pride that was of, of Adam and Eve that was appealed to. I say, he said, you'll be like a God. You're going to be great. You know, that's something we all want to buy into, right? We're great. You're going to be a God. I'm great. That kind of thing. And that is what the Satan, the snake, if you will, said. He appealed to their egos. He said, you're going to be, you're going to be like a God. And I would contend that being like a God is great when there's total humility in it. Where they, right. that you recognize ca how cause and effect works, you re you have considerate of you're considerate of others because that's the right thing to do. But when you when you want to be God because because you want to be great again, that's the false. There's uh, the, the self identity has no need for greatness. I I do this, I don't do that. I like this, I don't like that. I like that. that's self identity. Where is greatness in there? Just do and don't do. I am and I'm not. Greatness is just an adjective. So any time you want to be great, that's the ego. That's not the ego, the false ego. It's not even, it's, it's, it's worse than false. It's, it's double false. So mm, that's yeah. that. And that is where that evil is. That again, pride is the deadliest of sin. What is pride? Uh, the simple definition I give, a nice working, applicable, and useful definition is that's the idea that I shouldn't change. I shouldn't change. And, he, and, and humility right. is that I need to change. For who? To be the better me. The better me. Someone who's more considerate. Someone who's more considerate. Because I, I know I got too much selfishness going on. And whatever of these changes are, but the changes that are not self-aggrandizing, but to be mm -hmm. the better me so that I, I can serve people more without giving up myself in terms of uh, 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 an individual. Mm. That's, that's my basic Well, philosophy. do you believe the issue is do we have true love in our constitution or other co people? In the in, constitution in our, in of our, our being, country? In, no, in our being, in our, in our souls, do we really love other people? I, I think that that takes a development. You know, uh, right, yeah, it right. takes a development. So a person you know, has to learn what real love is and until they learn it, or maybe they're even incapable because they just totally lack it for themselves, a self-love. And that's not a, a narcissistic love but a love where you cherish this greatest gift that we all have, which is your own life, but not to cherish it with humility, not to cherish it. You know, what is, what did, what did uh, Jesus say in the Bible? He will save his life, will lose it, and he will give it up, will preserve it. So if you, if you cherish it as the great gift that you can give so much with it and, and evolve with it, that's the right attitude. But if you That's cherish right. so much that you're fearful of losing it, you, you're afraid of danger, you're afraid of risk, you're afraid of looking mm -hmm. bad, you're afraid of the embarrassment. No, that's, that's you know, I haven't gotten it. So loving, so it's a development. It's a development. It is a development. And some people uh, never develop it. So, I, I, absolutely. Uh, a lot of, like in, in psychology, people you call, many people with personality disorders, are incapable of love. They're so narcissistic. They're so self-absorbed. That's all they think about. And, and you think really many people, you have had this, we all have had this experience in our lives of showing love and getting no response. 
You know that. Absolutely. You have a reason. Can you explain that? Why, when you go out of your way to show love to somebody else, why you don't get anywhere? Because life's a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. Life is a bitch. Yeah. You know, one of the things I just had this discussion, uh, and it seems really, it's kind of funny because a lot of people seem to, this seems to be lost on them, is that life is difficult. People have this idea that it should be easy. Well, you can have that idea, but it ain't so, because life is not easy. Life is difficult, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're the richest person or the poorest person. Yeah, the richest person may have all these, you know, things that uh, find that money can buy, but life ain't easy for anyone. No, it isn't. Uh, let me ask you this, Tony. Uh, I don't think G Jesus made certain statements that may be misinterpreted. One of them is the poor are blessed and the poor in spirit are blessed. What he meant was the poor in spirit is humble. What he meant, he, he is not, does not, Jesus, I don't think, for better words, doesn't want people poor. He doesn't want, he wants an equal distribution of wealth that I'm convinced of, but he does want people who are poor that their sufferings be rewarded in the next life. But he doesn't want, in any way, uh, the Christian religion want people poor. I think Jesus wants, I think that Christ wants an equal distribution of wealth. And that's why in some sense, let me put it this way, Tony. In some sense, socialism may be closer to the Christian model than capitalism. It may be. Well, I know I would, I would say yes, and I would say uh, in some ways it is, in some ways it's not. But Christianity is not about greed and money. I'm sorry. No, it is I'm, not about that. It is not about that. No. And no so but, but, but a funny thing, though, you know, the the uh, the first church, actually the first church, and I really relate to them about that more the Gnostics than the than the Catholic Church based in the Vatican, uh, which took over from the Roman, you know, the Roman Empire, which mm -hmm. was lost. But um, the uh, that Catholic Church is maybe the richest organization in the world. <laughs> it could be. It is. It has a lot of assets. But on the other hand, I have to say this about the Catholic Church that they do a great deal of social good in the world. Totally. A great deal. Ab absolutely. You know, again, I, I mentioned I, was, I am a recovered alcohol. I used to go to AA and NA. Most of those meetings were in Catholic churches, okay, you know, Catholic schools uh, and, you know, and, and property owned by the church. So they are very altruistic. They are very community minded. They're all, you know, they do so much great charity and stuff by their communities. They do. So, and yeah. they don't one thing about the Catholic Church is that they don't exclude anybody. That's wonderful. And, everybody and that, gets included. That's and that and that's the and that I would say that that's God. There's so much there's so much exclusion today in the name of inclusion. It just boggles my mind. <laughs> you it know, does, uh, people want to discriminate, so they say that they can be more inclusive. It's like, yeah, I don't think you well, learned you the think, lesson properly. Don't you think people want to discriminate? Don't you think their motivation is that they want to feel superior to other people. So they will say that I'm superior to this black man, or I'm superior to this woman, or I'm superior to this Latino. I think that's the basic motivation, the desire to be above and superior to other people. That is the root of discrimination. That's my opinion. Well, I, you know, I, I would say it's definitely one of them. Uh, it's fear-based, uh, it's insecurity. It's about- It could it's, be fear, it could be fear. There's a sense of inadequacy. There's a sense uh, of, of, a, of there's an emotional uh, problem there. Uh, so but why is it the blacks were given such a hard time for years? For years, they were, they were lynched. They were beaten. It's terrible, obviously. They were, they, why is it the blacks were picked up? Well, it, it was systematized by the you know the Western colonizers. You know the British, the Spanish. Uh, and so the people actually say, oh, it's an American thing. I, I was started by the British and the Spanish, actually. And it became in the American colonies and in the South American, Central American, the Spanish, and then French as well. Uh, so uh, it was, uh, there was obviously fear, but you know, it was, it was capitalist. They you know he talked about, you know. It was money. They money made it. was them there, slavery, right? Slavery the was, there was slavery worked on the commercial area absolutely and you can't made, be you can't be labor you can't be labor that you don't have to pay for man are you kidding me of course that's right so they it was that is why there was a civil war 
because a lot of people didn't want were, were didn't want to lose money. Yeah, absolutely, great stuff. All right, listen, uh, we're gonna take we're gonna take one last break. Uh, even though I'm already, it's already. I, I don't want to end this conversation. We're going to continue it. It's so wonderful. Okay. I want to. So I'll have one final. It. I really enjoyed it. I'm really. I'm still enjoying it. We're still in it, bro. So okay. let, let's just take one final break, and then we'll right. come with the come come back with the last segment with Andrew Shacken. This episode of Self Help Coaching is brought to you by Perficio. What are the secrets to wealth? Benjamin Franklin taught them, but people are ignorant or just forget. What if you make sure neither afflicts you? Visit www.perficio.io. That's P E R F I C I O dot I O, where you can actually become certain you are on your way to wealth. You're listening to the Self Help Coaching Podcast with me, your host, Tony Petrozzo. We're having a wonderful, really fascinating and intriguing conversation with Andrew Shackin. Uh, and, you know, he, he just he, he put he said something that really pop something popped in my head i happen to know someone who's uh, people would say he's mentally ill okay whatever uh but this i would say this person is uh, something of a false prophet this guy believes that he is you know like G, you know the, the prophet of jesus uh and he, i would say this guy's this guy's got a number of personality disorders narcissistic paranoia a number of you know and and he thinks that god is his redemption and he's been anointed that said yes what this is related to something you had said but let me let me say this question and then we'll, we'll come back on the we'll kind of circle around on it. what okay, makes yeah. anyone great uh, if if they can move beyond themselves or in their right. selfish love right. of god uh, uh selfish that love of is, self of self yes Yes, I agree with you 100% on this. What makes a person a, put it, you put it the right way, a developed person yeah. is a person who doesn't want to get things from people, who wants to give things to other people. Yes. Someone who wants to serve other people and not outdo other people. That is what makes a person, a, as you use the word developed, that is the, a, a developed personality. A personality that um that will that has a desire to serve rather than gain and get that's the operative word serve that's the operative word my friend it is you know and i think i think that that makes that makes a an authentic person authentic is the right word if you want to embrace authenticity this is i think that's what you have to do you have to give up you have to give up your self-love Absolutely. Which is very difficult, right? Right, but I also got I, again, and I want to be—I don't want to repeat myself. Not the self-love that is narcissistic, not not the love that that cares for this gift. And what is this gift? My life. This is the greatest gift I have because if I didn't have it, I wouldn't be here to serve anybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? If I'm here to serve, and I believe I am, then I have to take care of myself so that I can do so. That's well. That's it. You know. So you can't really denigrate earning a living right. or having enough money because right. we need it. Right. You need it because you will, if you don't have money, if you don't have enough money, you will not be able to do anything for anybody. Absolutely. You know. So, <laughs> and, and, you know, and um, that brings me to my final question for you uh, is what is the goal in your life, Andrew? The goal in my life is to as as you as we discussed is to become a a developed person with the capacity for giving and exhibiting love and serving other people in love that is my goal and tony i'm not sure that i'm doing it i'm not sure that i'm capable of doing it but i'm certainly that is my goal it definitely, definitely. It is the goal is to is let me put it this way, is to give up myself. With without without sacrifice, there can be no salvation. No, Watch right. that, that movie, that, Andrew. That's a very good point. That's it. About and sacrifice. That's you right. just said it. Point. You just said it and you paraphrased it. You said it your own way. <laughs> okay. All right, Tony. <laughs> That, that's wonderful and i you know i concur man you know i i want to you know i just had to I, I mentioned my girlfriend because she's very relevant to me 
and we converse all the time. And, and she we just she was just talking about. I, I'm very ambitious, and I have a number of goals, uh, and and with increasing ambition and maybe even grandiosity. Mm-hmm. But and she go and I think that I'll be very wealthy. She goes, what about you? You talk about all this money. I'm like, but you know what? I don't have a single money goal. Not, not I have all these goals. Not a single one is a money goal. I mm-hmm. I know that money will follow, but that and I, that, I'm not going to say that's a a side effect. But it's not the thing I'm after. I want to create things that serve people, that cha- that solves problems in the world. That makes you know, that makes a better society. Absolutely, for all of us. absolutely. That's what I'm all about. And do I believe I should be, be wealthy because of that? Yes, I do. But I want to really, I want to spend, and then I want to take that money and spend it in greater ways and make right. you know, greater solutions for people. Uh, I'll give you an example. One of the things that I want to do, and my and this and my part and my partner, you know, I have this company Auxilium, which is this uh, technological coaching company. We created the world's first automated self coach, uh, self help coach, a virtual coaching program. Great, blah blah blah. Outside of that. We want to make another company that creates undersea cities where people live under the really? water, totally no self-sustained. And they never even leave. They never even leave it. Right. People, kids are raised. They never even seen the right. surface. Mm-hmm. I, could you imagine if this, if the world has a catastrophe, like, like those, like that, that ruined the dinosaurs and my sea cities are the only things that survived. <laughs> right. I, I, I'll, you know, and I say this tongue in cheek, I'll be the new Jesus, I, very tongue in cheek. Okay. <laughs> and that I was that people like say, you know, okay. everyone, the, the world died because of, you know, an asteroid, but the people in the sea, or maybe the people on, on um, Elon Musk's Mars colony or the, or the, uh, the, the lunar colonies that will have may live. I say that with tongue in cheek, but also what I'm saying is I want to create solutions for the world, better things for the world. That's a great thing, and if and and if they're good and they're successful, you know, I learned this from long ago that the, the in terms of money, which is a an issue and you know a prime subject that we've had, that is that is a person makes that by both by serving. There's that word again, serving mm. uh, the the qual the that is dictated on the quality and the quantity of the people they serve. Now, some people might object to that term quality. Quality of people? Yeah. People who can pay you more, you can, in that, in that regard, in that parameter, are higher quality people. That's not to say people, poor people are lower quality. No, uh, they're not. They're, they're absolutely not. Every person is deserves respect and dignity and compassion. Every person, no matter who, even, even criminals. That's not to say they shouldn't serve, they shouldn't face justice because <laughs> they should, uh, right? But that's how that's how money is made, dictated on the quality and quantity of the people you serve. So I want to serve high quality people. I want to serve low quality people too, if you will. Uh, but the, and and there's a quantity. And now and I'll make a bunch of money, but that's not the, that's not the target. The target is to do these great things in the world. Why? Because this gift that I have from God, from God, capital G, Mm -hmm. capital G God, is Mm -hmm. my life. And with this life, I can exercise the sub gifts, which are my talents and my skills that I develop and, and, and the wonderful spark, the divine spark within me. And I say that lower G, okay? That subservient that's part of God. You know, one of the things I mentioned that dog eared Bible of mine. Mm. One of my favorite uh, phrases out of it is when Jesus said, "The kingdom of God is within you." I don't believe in a heaven with a with a with a old man with a big long beard. Right. I yeah. I, I believe the kingdom of God is within me, and I have to exercise it to help the world and myself. Let me ask you this, Tony. We got to wind up soon. Yeah, we got to wind. This this is the wind up right here, Andrew. Okay, just one second. What are you going to do with people that don't want to be bothered with you? Bothered with what? With you or me? You let them. What go, are you going to do? Don't bother them. <laughs> don't bother okay. them. You have an explanation. Let, let me say this about about one statement of Jesus said about him that always sticks in my mind. They said about him, and they couldn't understand who is this man that eats with publicans and sinners. They could not understand why he would spend time with these dregs, but he did. He didn't spend a lot of time with them. He also said, he also said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? 
namely, can anything good come out of this hick town, this backwater? Those are the statements made about Jesus. They couldn't understand. They didn't understand him at his time. And that's why he died. They did not understand what he was trying to do. I don't think so. Yeah, there were there were people who understood them, and that might, you could say they were the disciples and and others, and there were people who don't, and and maybe and had some basis to them, and they were the people who said, "Give us Barabbas." <laughs> that's, that's right. Now that is that was a very significant event. Yes, it because was. Uh, they, as this is human nature, and you know it's human nature, Tony, to choose the worst. You know, you know, you know it's human nature. My, 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 um, I have a mentor. He certified me in neuro linguistic programming, which is a form of psychology that I practice, NLP, and, and in, in, in it's also called mind design. And he says there's a basic choice that humans make all the time, and, and, the, and the choice will surprise a lot of people. And the choice is this Do I want to choose diamonds or dog shit? It'll surprise you how often people will choose dog shit. They do. <laughs> Let me tell you something else. For every, I, I used to do a lot of criminal law as a lawyer. And yeah. I say this, for every guy in jail, I'm telling you, this is a fact, there's a dozen women that will love him to death. Yeah, 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 yeah. For every guy in jail, you can get a dozen women that are going to love this guy. Now, Andrew, I, don't, I don't know why. Andrew, I got to say, in terms of this podcast, this, this, is, this is probably the most unique conversation I've had on this podcast. Uh, it has been so fresh and original and organic, and, and we've really been, I, I feel that it's been a very honest and deep uh, discussion. I think, I think it's going to be very interesting to people, uh, and I thank you so much for coming on. I really, I really so am very grateful that you had me on here to express my thoughts, and I was glad to hear yours as well. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to meet you. And uh, do you have any final remarks for the audience? My remarks are um, uh, to remember what, to understand Jesus and his position that he, he chose to choose as his disciples, working men, not wealthy, not educated. He chose those people. And you have to understand where this man was coming from in his thinking. He didn't think, he doesn't think, Jesus did not think these people were stupid. They're not stupid. They're as smart as anybody else. And as I said, they could not understand with that statement, who is this man that eats with publicans and sinners? They couldn't understand it, but he understood why. Because he had the perception to see the worth of these people, whether, whether carpenters or whether people who followed him to, to his death. He had the insight to understand their worth and value and their intelligence. So I don't think that a carpenter is any less intelligent than some kind of executive. I don't think so. Great stuff, Andrew. And how do people contact you? Uh, and also, what do, you, what do they have to look forward to in the future for, from Andrew? You have further books that I'll be publishing. I'm I know publishing. There, are four, there are four. Uh, what, four what's the four first? books. Uh, yes, four books in my blogs. Political, literary, philosophical, and theological. I'll be publishing a book on the on the uh, miracles in the Bible and a book on the Book of Job, and um, those are my current projects. And I'm very glad to uh, to that. Also, I've written a chapter on paternity, the subject of paternity in New York New York law uh, New York family law practice, and I've written a a, a chapter on evidence. In Bender's Consolidated Evidence, I've written a chapter in Newark Jurisprudence on Criminal Law. So uh, I enjoy writing. I enjoy expressing my thoughts for what they're worth. And I hope people will read these things. Great stuff. What is your website, Andrew? Uh, Shack, S-C-H-A-T-K-I-N, show.com. That's Shack when you go on show. show.com. When yes. you go on that website, you will see... 900 blogs, over 900 blogs on all kinds of subjects, theological, philosophical, literary, and you will see 10 books listed. I hope you take a look at it, and I hope you'll enjoy the books. And you want to mention some of your social media profiles? Uh, yes, my social media has many of these blogs posted. They are LinkedIn, 
They are uh, Twitter. They just they just type in your name, Andrew Shackin. Yeah, you'll get it. You'll get it. They're okay, that's it. that. By the way, uh, listeners, that's S C H. S C H T K I N. Right. I'd love to hear from anybody, and I love I love to talk to Tony because I'll tell you one thing. For me, there's no greater privilege and honor than to know someone, than to know and understand another human being. Well, it, it, more was, privilege or honor. It, it was, I concur. And getting to know you just in this conversation has been my pleasure and it, to my benefit. Thank you very much, Andrew. And I Send really, me a link, will you? Oh, yeah. My podcast manager will be in touch with you. Uh, and you haven't heard the last of me personally either. I tell you that, my friend. <laughs> and, uh, oh, okay. Great stuff. And I, I want to thank you again for coming on. I want to thank the listeners for listening. And remember, everyone, we're all responsible for ourselves. And we can all use a little help. With that, I'll see you at the That next- is a fact. That is something I'm convinced of. That's why I have socialist sympathies. Because I do think that people need help. That's that's my mantra, so uh, I'm not (laughs) taking anything back. Great stuff, Andrew. Thank you. Take care. Thank you for tuning in to the Self-Help Coaching Podcast, where insights, attitudes, and methods for success get illuminated. Learn what leaders and change workers have done and are doing now to create magnificent futures. Remember to visit our website at self-helpcoaching.com and enjoy even more great episodes like this one. Again, while you're here, Subscribe to us via your favorite network. We look forward to seeing you next time on the Self-Help Coaching Podcast.